Welcome to our In Focus discussion tonight on Juneteenth. On Thursday, President Joe Biden signed a bill to make the celebration a federal holiday, an event that commemorates the end of slavery back in 1865. But according to a recent Gallup poll, approximately 60% of Americans don't know or know little information about what Juneteenth is. So tonight we will discuss its history, significance, and the local events taking place this weekend. Kicking off our discussion tonight are Sean Newell, the vice president of the NAACP Salt Lake Branch and Darlene McDonald, author and social activist. Thank you both for being here tonight. And Sean, we'd like to start with you. Let's begin with the history of Juneteenth. Can you tell us about its background, meaning and significance? Well, Juneteenth is a commemoration or a celebration of the final, <laughs> I should say after two and a half years, after the Emancipation Proclamation took place of the slaves in Galveston, Texas. They received that notification from the military after the last of the Confederate Army had surrendered. Yeah, and I think it's so important to make that distinction was that the Emancipation Proclamation um, was signed two years prior, but technically the, the final group of slaves didn't even know about it until two years later. Uh, Darlene, let's go to you. What was the immediate reaction or the events that followed after Major General Gordon Granger freed enslaved people in Galveston, Texas? Well, for this, the new freedmen, in 1865, they, there was celebration and they, a part of the order, the general had actually told the slaves to stay at the homes at, on the plantation with the slave owners. Most of them did not. Um, they wanted to go and find their families that had been sold into slavery or some that may have escaped up north. So many of the slaves did leave the plantation and unfortunately they, that was met with some violence. Many were murdered and lynched trying to leave the plantation. There were also some of the slave, slave owners who refused to actually free the slaves even after being told that the Emancipation Proclamation had passed. So some, even though they were free, and by law they were free, many of the slave owners still held them in captivity and enslavement. Yeah, we know there was a lot of violent pushback and the fight for freedom continued long after that. Sean, what do we know about the first public Juneteenth event? How was it celebrated and where did it go from there? Well, the first event had taken place in Austin, Texas, and uh, there were some, the, some of the freedmen actually purchased, uh, I believe, 10 acres of land to be able to have a place to have that celebration. Um, and, you know, as Darlene stated, there was still a lot of pushback. There was still a lot of subjugation going on in those days, which made it very difficult for the celebration to be uh, as wide and, and, and as expressed in the way that people wanted it to be expressed. Um, but through over time, and, and sadly, it's only kind of percolated through the black and African American community exactly what the celebration was about and why the celebration was taking place. Now, Darlene, by the 20th century, the Jim Crow laws were in effect, which segregated white and black people in public spaces like schools, buses, and bathrooms. How did that impact the concept of freedom and the celebration of Juneteenth? Well, unfortunately, it was pretty immediate, actually, that the concept of freedom did not mean free. When you talk about right after the, the freedmen, part of Juneteenth, when they first had the very first celebration, the Day of Jubilee, it was actually a day to register um, the new freedmen to vote. And right after that, many states started passing laws to disenfranchise black voters, black men particularly. So, it, so immediate, the concept of freedom was immediate, that they were not free. So that goes on into the 19th and the 20th century when you have the Jim Crow laws and black codes in the South because the uh, free labor and the, free, the um, slave owners wanted to be able to 
be able to participate in the economy. And there was some pushback against now having to have wages. So the black code, which uh, also with law enforcement, they would be they would take some of the um, freedmen and charge them for various petty crimes to be able to put them into jail so that they can actually have still have labor. So the concept of freedom really did not come until much later, as we know, until um, 1965. When, 1964, when President Lyndon Johnson passed the Civil Rights Act, and that overturned um, a lot of the segregation laws in the South. Right, it's just different forms of oppression, no matter how you slice it. Sean, according to that Gallup poll that we mentioned at the beginning of this segment, 60% of Americans know barely anything about Juneteenth. That is staggering. Why do you think that is? I, I, I believe it's just part of uh, the lack of education we have about all of the communities that we have here amongst us. Um, we still see the lack of uh, historical and civic information that includes um, parts of our history that are unpopular and uncomfortable for people to discuss. And that's where we run into an issue. Um, you know, with being able to really understand each other and where we come from, not knowing that history, not knowing that these occurrences took place is really harmful to getting that message out about these opportunities for people within our communities to celebrate. We have an opportunity now to expand upon this history. And given this, this celebration, given this um, national recognition, I hope that we can improve and allow for more education about some of the history that really impacts our systems and our country. Well said. Sean and Darlene hold that thought. We have to take a quick commercial break, but when we return, we'll resume our in focus discussion on Juneteenth. Thanks for staying with us for our second In Focus discussion tonight on Juneteenth. Before the break, we were joined by Sean Newell, the Vice President of the NAACP Salt Lake Branch, and Darlene McDonald, author and social activist. We pick up now right where we left off. We'll start with you this time, Darlene. Um, is there a concern that Juneteenth could be commoditized, meaning that stores will use it to push merchandise now that it's a federal holiday? What are the problematic implications that can come from that? I, I, I hear this a lot. Personally, I don't have a problem with that, especially if it's a lot of small black business owners. If they have t-shirts or little whatnots to sell, why not? Because the more merchandise that's out there, the more people will learn about this holiday and they will learn about the history and it may intrigue a few people and also prop up a few small business owners as well. So personally, I don't have a problem with that. Um, uh, not me. <laughs> That's a great perspective. Darlene, Juneteenth became a federal holiday where there are legislative efforts in states across the country to ban critical race theory. You were on the show with Glenn Mills for Inside Utah Politics to talk about this. How do the recent attacks on CRT square with Juneteenth? Go ahead, Darlene. It's good that you brought this up because we are right now in a moment where there's a lot of pushback on teaching history and teaching accurate history. And it, they frame this in the concept of critical race theory. And critical race theory is just the cost of racism. And because there is a cost to racism. And legal scholars use that framework to be able to study the cost of racism because what's past isn't past. And that's what CRT is for. Now, when, now that we have a federal holiday, Juneteenth, that is a step to start teaching history, real history. We understand that we have the, the framers of the Constitution and what some people call the founders of this country. Those founders were not perfect, but that's not CRT. That is learning history, an accurate history of this country. 
Thank you for sharing your perspective on that. Sean, do you think this will encourage more education of African American history in America, as well as before enslaved people were brought to America? That's my greatest hope, is that we can improve our education system and, and actually be authentic in our education. This is where civics education comes in, um, our historical education, and we have to start at a very young age. If we have an understanding of where all of our citizens come from, no matter what the, the um, process was or what, the, what happened to get us to where we are today, we'll have a greater understanding of how we can take care of issues that are current and then be able to mend things so that in the future, we can all have a better place to live. Well said. Sean, um, we know that there is still a long way to go to get black people the equality and equity that they deserve. What does our country need to continue to work on? We need to continue to work on civility. We need to work, figure out how to have constructive dialogue. Sometimes the tough conversations need to take place. And we need to make sure that we do that with a semblance of respect for each other when we get to the table and we're having conversations. It's not a hard thing to do. It's just a willingness to be able to be courageous and to step forward, to be able to talk to those that don't look like you, to be able to be willing to understand people that you've never talked to before and to understand that this is a way for us to overcome harm. This is a way for us to overcome angst. This is a way for us to be able to grow as people. And we have to do that through dialogue. Right, we have to get uncomfortable. We have to have yes. these difficult conversations in order to move forward. Uh, Darlene, final words. What would you like to leave our viewers with tonight? What do you want them to think about when it comes to Juneteenth? I would like to be encouraged that this is a step for us to really have, as Sean said, real honest and maybe even uncomfortable dialogue about the history of this country. I want people to know, and what everyone should know, is black history is American history. American history is black history. And if we, if we can be honest with ourselves and with one another, with one another about the history of this country, even if it's uncomfortable, then we can walk together and we can grow together and we can become that more perfect union that we have always aspired to be. Well said. There should not even be a distinction between black history or American history. You've been hearing from Sean Newell, the vice president of the NAACP Salt Lake Branch, and Darlene McDonald, author and social activist. Sean and Darlene, thank you so much for making time for us during your busy schedules. It was a pleasure to have both of you. Welcome to our third and final In Focus discussion tonight on Juneteenth. Rounding out our discussion tonight is Daoud Moomin, organizer for Juneteenth Utah. And Daoud, thank you so much for being here tonight. We're excited to have you. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, your background, your upbringing, and what it was like growing up in Salt Lake City as a first-generation Somali Muslim American? Yes, well, Rosie, thank you so much for having me. My name is Daoud Moomin. I'm a 20-year-old organizer here in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, my parents emigrated here from Somalia in 1996, um, fleeing a place of injustice, of war. Um, and they came here and really taught my siblings to um, stand up for what we believe in, to fight for a better world, for a better community. So um, I have been organizing since I've been about 15 years old um, to really fight for a better world, for not only the, uh, the black community, but also the Muslim community, first generation students, low income students, um, but also everyone that is marginalized and oppressed by um, systems of power that are um, disenfranchising certain groups of people. Um, so here. I am today just really continuing that fight and I'm um, really excited to be here. I love that and I'm so impressed with all that you've achieved at only Thank age you. 20 and I can tell your family influence and kind of planted that seed of passion in you at, from a very young age. Now the fight for racial equality and equity has been taking place for centuries yeah. but this past year was unique. It brought tensions to a boiling point again after the murder of George Floyd. So we're wondering, how are you reflecting on Juneteenth this year? Absolutely, this past year really has 
has um, galvanized this country around um, a mission of ensuring that black life is not only uh, valued, but fought for, um, that we are in the streets of Salt Lake City building community, fighting against oppression and violence against um, black Americans. And um, this year, we're, we're reflecting on a moment to really reckon with our, um, our present, our reality of, of police violence, of, of injustice, of uh, black communities are so often being at the um, brunt of of systems of uh, oppression and it's really important that this year we really center on education which we'll talk about much more further but it's really important that we know the world we're fighting for and um, really the way we're using Juneteenth this year is as a way to build community to ensure that um, the voices that matter the most are being centered the people that are willing to fight for us are known and um, really coming together to um, have a moment to take a deep breath and after that get back to work. That's a very positive perspective. I really love how you answered that. I'm asking all the guests this question. We talked about that recent poll. 60% of Americans barely know anything about Juneteenth. This is so concerning. In your opinion, what work still needs to be done to bring that number down? Absolutely, and I agree this number is very concerning. Understanding um, our history is really a vital part of fighting for a better world, right? We cannot know our past. Uh, we cannot know our past if we wanna fight for a better future. We, so we really have to dig into that history and ensure that um, the, the fight for black liberation and black justice is something that is um, something is, is commonplace, is, is, a, is a mundane thing to, 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 to know about. Um, and I think it, it's gonna be really important that one, we emphasize not only education in the classroom, right, but also education outside of it, right? How are we ensuring that community members, families, parents, teachers, um, government leaders are, are all really engaging in a nuanced um, education of, uh, surrounding Juneteenth, right? Whether it's reading books about black authors, reading, uh, uh, watching uh, black documents, documentaries, black films, it's really, really important that we're um, embracing black authors like ta Coates, Angela Davis, and, and just so many more. We really have to take that effort, right, yes. to take those initiatives, mm -hmm. documentaries, the books, like you said, to educate ourselves. Um, because oftentimes it's buried, right, in um, uh, non-minority um, figures and whatnot. Uh, Daoud, in your opinion, why is it important to support recognize our black community, especially in a state like Utah where the black population is only 2%. Oh, it is just extremely important because we're, um we're really at a precipice, especially here in Utah, where we've seen a, a especially a shift here in Salt Lake City um, about justice, right? We've seen a shift in attitude, a shift in perspective, but also a shift in a dedication to the fight towards that justice. So it's really important that we're uplifting black organizers, black activists, black community members, so that we really know how to best support these communities, how to best stand up with these communities, and how to best fight back with these communities. It's all about ensuring that um, um, you are willing to do the work to support black communities, whether that be fiscally, academically, whether that be um, in your communities, whatever it may be, whatever avenue you can find to support black communities, it's gonna be a really essential way because uh, black community members aren't stopping this fight, aren't gonna quit this fight because no one's standing with us, but we do wanna ensure that this fight for black liberation is really a fight for everyone. Well said. Well, you are the organizer of Juneteenth Utah, so I wanna get to the most important question of this interview. Tell us about the events taking place this week in honor and celebration of Juneteenth. Yes, we are so excited and so honored to be hosting our second annual official Juneteenth Utah celebration at Liberty Park from four to nine on uh, Saturday, tomorrow. And we're gonna be having just such a great evening full of um, food trucks, speeches, performances, dancing and music. And really, like I said earlier, a night to one, reckon with our reality, but two, come together to not only um, look at what we've done and look at our present, but also look at what we're fighting for because really we're, we're fighting for a world that has never existed for black Americans and uh, we look forward to really just bringing the community together to celebrate that. And it's gonna be a good time. Oh, it's gonna be a good it's time. It's gonna be great. <laughs> <laughs> You've been hearing from Dawood Moomin, organizer for Juneteenth Utah. Dawood, thank you so much for being here tonight. We look forward to this eventful weekend. Thank you so much for having me. We can't see you. We can't wait to see you, Utah.